and welcome listeners to another very special episode of Cathode Raycast, the story screen podcast where we talk about all things television. I am your host, Bernadette Gorman-White, and today I'm joined by... Robbie Anderson. And... Mike Burge. And we're here to talk about the revolutionary show on HBO that just ended, Watchmen. Now, we were all pretty hot on this show coming on. We already had pretty high anticipations for us liking it, and it delivered. So, boys, overall, what did you think? You can go into spoilers. I think if you're coming to this podcast, listeners, it's because you want to hear us talk about Watchmen. So we're assuming that you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, we recommend it, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, Burge, <laughs> Burge might not recommend it. Today is the day we find out that Burge was not into Watchmen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just going to play devil's advocate, you know, just really just kind of be like something just little, just it's a little me. It's a little pretentious. No, yeah, it, I mean, it's very it's pretentious. It's very pretentious. Yeah. It's like, I don't want my TV show to be like a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my problem with the Watchmen graphic novel. It's too, it's too, like a it's book a too much like a book. It's too much like a paper and, and the I hate, reading. I fucking hate books. I fucking hate them. Burn them, <laughs> burn them all down. Uh... <laughs> yeah, no, to keep it kind of like professional and critical, uh, this this show's fucking awesome. It slaps, it fucks, it does all the good things that I want it to do. Yes. Uh, I had a great time watching it. It was a lot of fun because it would be on Sundays mm-hmm. and the three of us would kind of catch it because the three of us are the um, like the heart, lungs, and brain, the organs that run Story Screen Beacon Theater. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, like we're in there. Uh, Our water cooler is, is behind the counter. Yes. Yeah. And we would all just kind of be like, can you believe it's still like good? Like that was my shock every week. Every it's like, week. it's still good. It, and not only is it good, the last episode was great. There's no way it can get better. And every episode, pretty much all the way through, finds a way to be better. Yeah. Until the final episode where it just finds a way to kind of be an ending, but also a conclusion. I don't want to get ahead and everything. But I think that was one of the things that I really like talking to you guys the most about was, can you believe how good this thing is? Like, it shouldn't be allowed to be this good. It shouldn't work as well as it does. And it does. Yeah. I, I mean, it's one of my favorite shows of the decade, without a doubt. Uh, I I fell in love with it. I, I love the way that it started. Um, and I and I really – and I think, you know, the show has some pushback with its audience where some people are like – the first, like, three episodes or so, they're like, what – like, why is this a Watchmen show? Why is this just not, like, a different show in the Watchmen universe or something like that? And then it kind of really comes together in episodes, like, four and five. And then once it kind of goes full circle with the source material and the show, it kind of, like, really starts to, you know – coalesce into one singular like Watchmen single uh, sequel that's like really strong but uh, yeah you know it's it's really a feat in terms of like doing adaptations doing sequels uh, you know David Lindelhoff is able to kind of like uh, like retcon and change in the in the most eloquent way possible like more than like I think any creator who's like building off of nostalgia which is the thing that a lot of creators do right now has ever done um, it, it, the show is brilliant. I love what it's doing. It's it's crazy how you know Watchmen never didn't feel modern, and this feels so modern now. And uh, you know, I'm a big I'm a big lover of the graphic novel, and I'm and I'm more. I I don't think we there's a lot of reasons we we live in the bad timeline, <laughs> but in the bad timeline we get the best Watchmen show. So that's the trade off you get, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lindelof definitely took it to heart that he knew he was bringing historical accuracy to this Watchmen series. And so the way he took this graphic novel and adapted it to our modern times, like you said, Robbie, Mm -hmm. is very cool to see, especially because he intertwined actual American history into the story because obviously the graphic novel also has American history built into it. Until it doesn't, until it becomes its own spinoff of what history did in this Watchmen universe. Right. But he took that the Tulsa riot back in 1921, that actually happened because that was pre-timeline change for the Watchmen story. Yeah. And so, so cool to see him, as you said, make this super modern and add his own spin in a very genuine way. 
Yeah. And I know Damon Lindelof, as a white man, kept arguing with himself, saying, am I the right person to tell this story? And then he assembled a crack team of writers, set designers. Directors. Yeah, directors, yeah. costume designers to bring this to life. And he's continuously said, this isn't my baby. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. And it shows. It is a well-woven masterpiece of all of these different lines of thought and thinking and experience wrapped into one. Mm-hmm. It's I mean, very, very good. The the show is woke AF. I don't think we can argue <laughs> that. It is the wo- it is the wokest show I think yeah, I've ever it, seen. And it is very. I think it's very responsible and respectful of everything that it's doing, both to its source material and the real life that it is creating alternate timelines of yeah. across the board. I think it it does that with gender, race, religion. Fuck. I mean, it even kind of like it gives you. I think one of the most honest interpretations of why a white supremacist actually genuinely feels that they are right in this. Does that mean that I agree with them? No. I don't think the show agrees with them either. No, not at all. But I think that you really do. And that's what the best thing is. Like he gets this great villain monologue. Again, in spoilers. Yeah. uh, He gives this great villain monologue and then just just turned into goop. But like in that monologue, you're just like, yeah, this is this is the whole thing. And it's uh, white supremacy is not a very difficult thing to understand. It's rooted in jealousy and hate and fear of the other and the like your own self worth and stuff like that. Yeah. Exactly. But it is kind of like interesting to like give that kind of monologue to a villain towards the end and just mm-hmm. have them be like just like talking about this very real world thing that they want to do and then the <clears> master plan of becoming both president and god which is a little mm-hmm. uh, fun right now to, yes. to to make that direct comparison well, what's the what's the line that uh i think keen has in either the third to last episode or the, like the penultimate episode and he's just like it's getting harder to be a white man out there no yeah <laughs> it's yep. just like and it's like you know after he says all like sci-fi mumbo jumbo and then it finally connects to like the white supremacy kind of like Mm -hmm. the two objective because at one point i'm just like oh the white supremacy is just a front it's just like no no we're we are racist yeah don't worry Mm -hmm. about it we're (laughs) definitely totally racist. the mom from titanic racist the only the only unbelievable thing in the show is that they're actually very intelligent to make this weird machine which is like which is totally outside the realm of normal white supremacy where they're all fucking morons so yeah. it's a little bit sci-fi spin, you know? <laughs> yeah. A little we're bit of mysteriously sci-fi. quiet, probably. We, we looked at, me and Vern looked at each other. We weren't just like silent for the listener. <laughs> like, well, you guys, you guys think white supremacists are really smart. Uh, I think I, there are a couple of them involved who happen to be smart. And oh, I see. But then the rest of them are kind of just following. Hillbillies. And hoping and just to like, get something Just from like the in, in real life. You yeah, know? there's a yeah. few. Smart. It's that <laughs> argument with like Hitler and stuff like that. And it's like Hitler was a very smart guy to pull off what he did. Mm-hmm. No one else has pulled that off in modern history. It's kind of happening again right now, but I think it'll stop because I, I, I believe in Harvey Dent. I believe that we will be able to stop this before that happens. We need our white knight. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. That's not what I meant. <laughs> uh, but I, I do, do, do either of you guys watch Mad Men? I always forget, mm-hmm. like, Mad I Men. So really the guy who plays Senator Keene Yo, okay. is a central figure in Mad Men. Mm-hmm. Not really a main character, so to speak, but he is one of the biggest memes that co- to come out of Mad Men Right, uh, is the not great Bob. I don't know if you've heard that. Uh, I have heard not great. Yes. It is, uh, yeah. and the 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 platform of that joke is like a very bad episode is happening to this one central character, and we're learning a lot about them. A lot of bad things are ga- happening. They get into an elevator. Bob, the character, Senator Keen, the guy plays yeah. Bob, and he goes, "How you doing?" He's always a chipper guy, and he goes, "Not great, Bob." <laughs> and that's so. It was funny because I didn't recognize him at first, right? And then I realized I was like, "Oh, that's that snack from Mad Men. That's Bob." <laughs> and then he t- he takes up. Tell me he's not a snack. He's a snack. Homeboy's those, a snack. Those, and those, well, he's wearing the Dr. Manhattan undies, too. Yeah. I'm just like, mm. A little too much for this gal over mm-hmm. here. <laughs> what it takes all kinds. It takes all kinds. It's what true. Whatever. But yeah, I definitely think that they jumped on the bandwagon. He was definitely amassing followers, Keen was. Mm-hmm. And it didn't matter, really, who they were to him. He was so above that level. He was already yeah. distancing himself on a god level. Yeah, he had the god at complex yeah. at that point. Certainly, you know. certainly. I mean, if you're, you know, hatch a plan to kill a god. Mm-hmm. That's, the, that's the other thing I think the show is like so crazy to do. Like Lindelof was like, all right, so let's kill Dr. Manhattan. Mm. They, gave us the sh- they gave us the steering wheel to Watchmen. 
let's kill Dr. <laughs> Matt. And it's like, okay. Well, I also, yeah. you know, he's got like it a, makes sense. He's got to have like a three, four season plan. I think he, in interviews, he's always been pretty coy about it. That's, Not to say that's quiet. Lindelof. Yeah. That's, that's fair. Yeah. But like, he's always been like, if there is more arcs or larger arcs like ahead of this one, I I think he really put the steam for those is not there yet. He put all the the gusto in this season to make mm-hmm. it what it is. Well, it's I think that the looking back on it, we'll see exactly what choices he makes. But I yeah. think it's interesting that this first season, in comparatively to theoretical seasons that will come, this first season is very much about Doctor Manhattan and Adrian Veidt. Mm. Lori is kind of an ancillary character revolving within this world and kind of locking it down. So I have a feeling that season two will focus a little bit more on Lori and um, Night Owl. I think that yeah, they'll finally him, cast right? him. He's been in prison this whole time or something like that. I was going to say, my only real criticism of the first season of Watchmen, um, and I think it, it, it boils down to them like cutting out an episode almost mm-hmm. from like the original like season order. Um, is that I felt some of the side characters like uh, Looking Glass and Lori like didn't get by the end of the season like enough time to shine because mm-hmm. they're they're more like front loaded. It's yeah, you know, and, and they and give them each their episode yeah. lost style, leftover style. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that for the sake of like wanting to they stay keep with things the interesting isolated. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that they're trying to not do too much at once to overwhelm the viewer. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I think they kept it very tight. And the nine episodes make sense to me. Oh, it works. Yeah, Yeah. it definitely works. I don't think they needed an extra filler episode. Isn't it like the nine issues of Watchmen that it's kind of like? Well, there are nine issues of the comic within Watchmen, Tales of the Black Freighter. Oh, okay. Before the main. There's 12 issues total, yeah. But there are nine Mm -hmm. issues of that comic within the comic. Before that artist goes missing. Yeah. And now we have Pedipedia to take the place as uh, Black Raider. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I think it, it works for what it is. And personally, I don't think I really want any Watchmen until they're telling me that Watchmen is here. <laughs> because mm-hmm. I don't want to get my hopes up. Whatever Damon says, I think he is being coy. But I think yeah. his coyness also comes from him being a genuine fanboy and him he's, saying, like, I can't believe they let me do this. Yeah. And he's also said that he he's like, I'd be down for someone else to, to do each season, you know. Which I don't like. But that's I, I fine. mean, <laughs> as long as they keep the same kind of writers and directors, the crew, I think that, again, this team that Lindelof kind of put together, if somebody else wants to step in as showrunner. Sure. I think that that would be like a fun choice. See how season two goes. And if it doesn't work, I mean, that's the thing with season two in most shows. Season two usually is where shows kind of change into what they're going to be. And that that process can be a little iffy. But once they get there by the end of season two, you're usually like, this is everything that was good about season one. And it's a little bit better. Now let's go. Like that's ten. That tends to be like usually what's going on with like older kind of like yeah. full on shows. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you look at something like Hannibal, where like I think season two is really when it's the show that it's going to be, and it just sticks the landing so hard. Mister Robot season two is another good example of that, where it really changes into what it is mm-hmm. in season two. Um, but I think about like other shows, like Dexter, like had a really strong season two, but it like almost like put itself God, in a corner. I love season two of Dexter. That's my favorite one. I, I love season four, but season three kind of sucks. And I think it's because season two was like so radical that it, was, mm-hmm. it almost was like, how do we, how do we get out of this corner that we, this interesting corner that we put ourselves into? So I, I'm curious. I don't really know where Watchmen can go from here. Um, but I didn't even know Watchmen could go where it went. So who the fuck knows? That's true. Right? That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that. Uh, there's so many good projects out there that I don't know if we need this until it's correct. But yeah, you guys are saying the right things, obviously. Mm-hmm. Like if if they put together the right <clears throat> people in this assembly line, it will be good. Yeah. But yeah, I'm just gonna wait until they tell me it's happening. Until then, it's not happening yeah. as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't think a season two would feel as complete as like a season one could be like bow tightly wound, you're good to go. Right. You know, you don't need more. You could also like wait a long time in between these things. Although That's true. HBO is very desperate right now, they also I feel like they, HBO does not have their Game of Thrones anymore, so they are like fuck. Yeah, I mean they also they're I, I feel like they strike while the iron's hot. Like maybe they a little do. too hard or a little too exactly, hot. Yeah. You know, like mm-hmm. they the metal the metal sword they made is a little wobbly and goopy <laughs> still, and they're like it's done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was. Uh, 
laying awake at night thinking about Watchmen <laughs> once. And I was thinking of like, you know, it's weird that they didn't do 12 episodes because it's 12 issues. Right. That, and 12 episodes is like your typical kind of season these days, like somewhere between like 10 and 12, maybe 13. Uh, and I think it's interesting that these shows, the season one kind of works in threes, where every three mm-hmm. episodes kind of feels like an issue. Yeah. And so by that stance, we have our first three issues in season one. So that leads me to believe that there's kind of like a four season arc or a three season arc that'll lead to nine or a four season arc that'll lead to 12. I buy that. And I think that Lindelof is a planner. He does plan ahead. He doesn't always link on them. He doesn't always like kind of link up with what he's trying to talk about because as he asks questions that he kind of has answers that he wants to Mm – kind of like dig into, he realizes the answers aren't as interesting in the que- as the questions. This is why some people don't like Lost or Leftovers or certain things that Lindelof does. Or right. it's like, no, that's the point. You know, you, if you're going into Alien Covenant and you want like answers to Prometheus, even though Lindelof had nothing to do with Covenant, it's Covenant is very much a reaction to the questions that Lindelof was raising in Prometheus that he didn't answer. Much in the same way Last Jedi is a response to Force Awakens. It's very interesting in that way where J.J. Abrams on Star Wars and Damon Lindelof on Prometheus, these sci-fi movies who are known for like their mystery box questions, answers, tactics and writing yeah. are taken over by, you know, uh, another writer who is like in the case of Alien Covenant, it was Michael Green and in Last Jedi is Ryan Johnson. And these guys kind of take apart the foundation of what's been built by these like questions and stuff like that and give different answers that maybe you didn't expect or that you kind of don't want. Uh, Challenging. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that in that way, Damon Lindelof not taking over season two could be interesting because that could be someone's kind of coming in and they're like, so now what do we do? I do agree, though, that the crew that he has assembled for this is perfect. I think that it's very much on them as they well might, as him. They might promote from the inside to showrunner. Exactly. Well, Nicole Cassell I, I think that proved herself better, an amazing director. Choice, yeah. Like, she'd be a great showrunner. Yeah. I mean, the only person that, like, is, like, a mainstream TV showrunner that comes to mind is um, uh, Noah Hawley for me. But, like, mm-hmm. you know, he's more his, – his strength is more in, like, the psychedelic than I think it is in – what Watchmen is necessarily doing, but I do think his spin on something like Watchmen would be really cool Mm -hmm. because Watchmen, like, from the page is, like, very colorful and psychedelic with its, like, you know, bright, warm hues and, you know, like, Dr. Manhattan's kind of, like, the outlier color in, like, that thing. Yeah, all the stuff on Mars in the comics is, like, straight out of, like, Strange Tales, Dr. Strange Yeah, it's cool. And there's no reason why a season two of Watchmen can't be a little bit more psychedelic than Absolutely season not, one. Yeah. Like, I'd, I'd actually invite a tone change. I mean, if you have Regina King b- maybe becoming this Dr. Manhattan mm-hmm. lady thing, you know, I, I think that'd be a psychedelic experience. Mm-hmm. Well, Noah Hawley also did uh, Fargo on FX, too, which is not psychedelic. Right, yeah. So he has other so, capabilities, So he sure. can make Watchmen in the snow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I sure. mean, <laughs> but I totally understand what you mean because Noah Hawley's kind of shooting style and cinematography instincts do lean more towards the psychedelic. They yes. do kind of – he does yeah. – he uses lenses and aspect ratios in a way that kind of mess with your viewership. Mm-hmm. Kind of like at the Regina King episode where she's uh, – Angela, sorry. Which she uh, goes through like the memories and stuff of her grandfather. It's an insanely psychedelic episode yeah. that is really kind of hammered down by – color and framing Mm -hmm. that I thought was like, so god damn it, this goddamn show is so much fun. Every episode is so unique. That that episode like like a Terminator 2 style, like like destroyed my body till it's just a skeleton and blew my mind so Mm -hmm. hard. Like that I you know, if you weren't I think the looking glass episode Mm-hmm. That's that's when the show really starts like fucking kicking ass, well, it's, like t- kung fu style. Like Tim the Looking Glass is great. It's true. It's, yeah. Well, like you know, the Looking Glass episode happens, and you're like, "Holy shit, it can't get any better than this!" And they're like, "Keep your fucking dick in your pants." And then they <laughs> then they have she took his pants. He can't keep his. He dick can't in his keep pants. his dick in his pants. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then you get the uh, nostalgia episode. Mm-hmm. And then after that, you're in Doctor Manhattan Town. And that's, like, some of the most interesting stuff of the whole season. And you're just like, what the fuck's going on? And that's – it's wild. That show is wild. It has, like, five episodes of, like, perfect television. hmm Yeah, it's so strange to even narrow down these little glimpses of plot 
into episodes. Yeah. Because once you start talking about it in this context, it's just so fluid. Every episode bleeds into another episode. It really yeah. does feel like a nine-hour movie yeah, to me. Absolutely. Or like a ten-hour movie, essentially. It's it's crazy that they stuck the landing. And that, that was like always like the thing at the at the water cooler, like – you know the water cooler we have behind the counter at Story Screen. That Is that we what we're gonna refer to? In we're always leaning. Cooler? We're always leaning on the water cooler. You know, not doing enough work. Just like you know, bullshitting. And we're just, and you know, every I just every week I was like, I just I, can they can they stick the landing? And like I think the last episode's like, you know, a little bit messier than some of the other ones, but it's great yeah. and it totally it totally works. It's a new metaphor for the House of Cards like theory of just like the more you build up a house of cards, like you know, like the bigger they are, the harder they fall, kind sure. of thing. Or like a house of cards with too many moving parts is will fall eventually. You can only go so high. But this was just like every episode was just a new layer and build it. And like by the end of the first episode, you're like, look at this fully complete house of cards. That's amazing. Yeah. Where are they going to go from here? And you just keep building onto it and making it bigger and bigger. And the likelihood of it be of it failing just becomes bigger and bigger with every week. And yeah. you're like, they have to fail. It's too big right now. Yeah. They've done too much. There's no way that this can be as good as the last episode. And they just keep Adrian bites in fucking space. What does it mean? It's great. It's great stuff. <laughs> he he's actually PDPedia is probably the is the black freighter in the meta sense, but his story is the black freighter in Watchmen, I think, because he's just like the stranded. Oh, he's the stranded character. He's like uh, losing touch with humanity. Losing touch with humanity. He's marooned from society. Um, yeah, I love. I mean, um, uh, Jeremy Irons is like so fucking good in this show. Yeah, it's strange that. I find it hard to really accurately cast Vite as a character. I definitely don't think Matthew Good was exactly the right casting for the film. He looked he seemed the very part. young. Yeah, but it's a tough character to crack. Jeremy Irons is like the Vite that I didn't know that I wanted or needed. Absolutely, but he definitely works in this role. He's he, daddy. He's dad. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. He was. <laughs> it was. It was sold to me him being Vite early on, but I think. Um, the most fight he's being is in the um, flashback or all time is flat and <sighs> happening at once where he's talking to Dr. Manhattan, who at this point is um, Cal Abar in mm-hmm. embodied. Um, and when he's kind of scruffy scarf wear and fight. Like yeah, he has eight, a, 80s, 1980s. Yeah, he's just like, like well, I have to drop more squids so on the ground again. <laughs> he's like losing his shit because he can't take that. Yeah, he saved the world, but his and, ego no is so knows. big. He's but like, also, people need to but, know. But the world also like still sucks. He's like, why did you d- d- just build more nuclear power? I gave you this. <laughs> and it's it's God, good. It's good. Um, but like that scene where they're talking and, and he kind of has the reveal. He's like, I'm going to keep doing this Jeremy Irons impression. I, Please. I wanted to, <laughs> I my plan A was to give you this thing that erased your memory. And uh, that whole se- that whole sequence of them talking like feels the most like Watchmen pulled from the graphic mm-hmm. novel that, like out of the entire show. And you know, I think it's because like timeline wise it's kind of the closest to mm-hmm. Watchmen proper, you know, mm-hmm. in in what we're seeing in the series as well. I mean, yeah, it's only just like a few years after their mm-hmm. big talk at the end where it's just like, do you think it was worth it? Right. I mean, it really is like it seems like the full crux of season 1 is the relationship between the Dr. Manhattan. Watchmen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But and specifically Dr. Manhattan and Vite and not only their relationship to each other, but their relationship to the world and like yeah. what does Dr. Manhattan mean to the world and what does the world now mean to Dr. Manhattan? And that's a hard thing to pin down because Dr. Manhattan is constantly living throughout all timelines and yeah. stuff like that. And he knows what's going to happen. So creating this kind of thing where he's in love. Well, he's he's more – he's more like man – he's more like human than Vite is despite being so out of time. Because yes. like – and that's always been Dr. Manhattan. Like, this is the god the he, god complex. He yeah. – Always, he's always subjugate, subjugated to love. He falls in love with these women who he probably shouldn't be falling in love with because he kind of ruins their fucking lives. <laughs> <laughs> they all seem to be very affected. That's kind of the thing that I, I, I like that the show really, I, I think, solidifies. is like you have sympathy for Dr. Manhattan, but like he's kind of a dick. Like he's not that good of a dude. He doesn't have people's best interests in heart. Like he makes a society of people 
and leaves them. Mm -hmm. He ruins many women's lives over the course of his deity-like existence. One of the things that's the most interesting about the comics for me that I think that they kind of transfer into the show is that Dr. Manhattan is not a good guy in the sense of an optimist. He is the most realist you are ever going to get. He is not being mean. He is not being cruel. He's like, this is the way that it is. Any choice that I make is a choice that we have already done. It has already happened. I am not changing anybody's mind. This is the way that it is. Like in literal terms. He's not doing anything to be mean or Mm -hmm. cruel. And And he's not even attempting to justify what's happening. He's like, It is what it is. To quote the Irishman, it is is what what it is. is. And I think that they land that very well in the show where it's just like he is a a hero in the sense of like he's a good guy. He's a good person. But he's also insanely realist uh, to the point where it's like there is no optimism or pessimism that can be present that's not rooted in reality of what's already going to happen, you know? Yeah, I think it's a hard thing to wrestle with, but I also think when he falls in love with these women, even though he knows that it's going to bring them tragedy, he also knows that it's going to bring him tragedy. Yeah. And I don't think he's like, well, I'm going to fall in love with this woman or vice versa, make her fall in love with me. And then I'm going to take the love from it and then leave. And I know that's what I'm going to do. I think he realizes that love is going to happen between these two people. He knows it's going to have a start and it's going to have an end. But I don't think he does it for a selfish reason, to get the love and then bounce. I think he's just like, this is what's going to happen. It's It's page 46 in the book. He's reading the book. Like, he's just like, Mm -hmm. yeah, but I've already read page 97, so I know that, like, blah, blah, blah. And they're just like, what? It's his his unique interaction with time that I think makes it less selfish. Because to him, it's like, I'm not – like, we're not experiencing love and then tragedy. I'm experiencing love and tragedy at once. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. he's already been killed or turned into vapor dust. Uh, a few times all at once to him, you mm-hmm. know. He's putting himself back together before. Yeah, it's not about the destination. It's, it's the, the climb. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the song. Oh, good. But, uh, the climb. but I do think, you know, when you, you know, I don't know. A- Angela, I guess, got a pretty sweet deal because at the end of the day, she might be a, a new god. So, you know, I guess that's fine. <laughs> yeah, and not to discredit Lori or say that Lori isn't as strong as Angela because they both have their strengths. They both have their weaknesses. That's what I found most interesting about the Angela, Dr. Manhattan slash Cal relationship is that she really takes some real agency in that relationship. And I think she's the woman who is with him that understands his life and his experience the best. Well, she fights, she fights for him, you know, whereas like Lori, like she ran away and both right. are good and both for good reasons. Like they both had their reasons for doing it and they're both like pretty valid, you know? Yeah. And just Angela being aware of, oh, now this is how you're experiencing something. For yeah. the instance, when they get into the fight <laughs> and she says, well, we're just not going to fight. This, and he was like, this is the this, beginning of the he's fight. Like, this is the fight. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the very end of the fight, she had been told in the past that she tells him to leave. She doesn't want to tell him to leave, though. She wants to break the cycle. But for him, it has to happen that way yeah. because that's the way it happened. And so she, I think, is like the first willing participant in his experience of life. And she has the power to say, all right, leave. Yeah. Even though it's done in completely a different way that probably what he was aware it would happen or she was aware it would happen. Maybe. It's interesting. It's kind of like totally. a rewriting of history yeah. in that scene. It's I mean, very cool. I think the show, uh, Dr. Manhattan, Dr. Manhattan's like omnipotence. Uh, I do think like – Was that your Jeremy Irons impression? Omnipotence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just squeeze it in there. Uh, as much as I can. Um, I think that, you know, everything he predicts and sees uh, happens accordingly. Right. And you keep expecting Angela to be like, no, she much like how she believes, like she's the one that can change the future. It, 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 he he gets zapped in that moment. He gets zapped again and and turned into dust or nothing. I don't fucking know. I still think he could come back. Oh yeah, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, he put himself. <laughs> it's back. not real. It's a TV show. I they guess. can write whatever they want. <laughs> I forget sometimes. <laughs> it could be the easiest thing. It's like all they have to do is just like, yeah, that wasn't the real Doctor Manhattan or. Oh, it was like a blah, blah, blah. Or they just go, science. Like, they can make up yeah. anything. They well, do. I mean, they vaporized him in the book, and he put himself back together. He gets vaporized twice. Vaporized. vaporized. He gets vaporized twice <laughs> in the book. Vaporized. Vaporized. <laughs> he's a big squid. Uh, yeah. 
I, on the Lori and Angela comparisons uh, as Dr. Manhattan uh, sneezes, Dr. Manhattan, that's that's my Jeremy Irons. Um, If you would like to do comparisons, we don't have to. (laughs) No, but I I do think it's interesting of, uh, you know, because one of the things that we were talking about was uh, at the water cooler was like how Lori is kind of like not necessarily tricked, but like she doesn't realize that the mom from Titanic is like also... A racist. <laughs> the, I forgot she was in Titanic. She's the mom. This is very funny. She's the to mom. Me. You have okay. to marry well. You have to marry well. Oh Jesus. Um, the uh, it's like uh, like Lori uh, in the comics is very full of herself. She's very and justifiably so. Um, very self righteous and very justified in her actions that she knows what's going on. Yeah. And her experiences and her job title and her successes that we are even shown very briefly at the in at the beginning of the first episode that she's introduced in is all about justifying how good she is at her job. Yeah. Well she's like a legacy child 100%. to you know, she's still expect her because her mom was Spectre. And, yep. and then she finds out that her dad was also a costume vigilante, mm-hmm. so then she kinda once once all those things come to light, she kind of goes like the opposite mm-hmm. direction. And tries to, but I would uh, I would say just in the in the comparative nature of Angela and Lori as far as their relationships, the Doctor Manhattan and what those relationships mean to those characters, as far as my interpretation from the comics, what we see of Lori's kind of longing for Doctor Manhattan in one way or another in the show, and Angela's interactions with both Cal and Doctor Manhattan. I would say that Angela's love for Cal and Dr. Manhattan is very um, not that not self-serving, that she is actually genuinely in love with this person and is kind of weighed down by the responsibility of being in love with this person mm-hmm. and knowing that it's going to end. Whereas Lori was constantly fighting back, always, and very confused because, and it's not her fault, she no. was going through a lot of shit towards the end of Watchmen because she was learning a lot about herself yeah. and her past and what's going on. And Dr. Manhattan is not exactly the best shoulder to um, confide in because he's just like, yeah, I fucking knew that. Yeah. I've had this conversation with you before and I just never told you. Like, and she's like, I'm on Mars. <laughs> like it's, I can understand Things it. are weird. Yeah. And I think that Lori being like a very interesting character in both the comics and the show does not make her a perfect character. Yeah. And that does not mean that Angela's character is perfect in any way. But I do think that the faults that Lori has in the comics are moved over generation decades later into Lori's character. One of those main things being that sometimes she can't see past her own um, self-righteousness, that, that, that her own like heroism. I am a hero and I get to define what a hero mm-hmm. is and I'm in control and masked people suck. I used to be a masked person, so I am allowed to say that, that kind of thing. She has that kind of tood. Um, and I think Angela is very much the opposite of that where she almost doesn't want to be a mass vigilante, but she knows that it's needed. She's Batman, essentially. She she knows that she needs to keep doing this in order to well, I think just she wants protect to... this one small spot of Tulsa. Sure. I mean, she wants to be – she wants to do law enforcement, but the only way to do law enforcement in this day and age is to be a mass right. – not visually. Mm, yeah, like the Watchmen mm. are Justice League. They're the whole country, if not the whole planet. We yeah. see them go to other places. Everything in the show, Looking Glass, Red, um, uh, Sister Pirate. Knight. Pirate, Pirate, Pirate Jenny. Pirate Jenny. Jenny. They are go. all just Tulsa. They're just cops, Yeah, you know? And so it's, it's really interesting that it's like confined down to just such a specific spot. And it kind of isolates why it is important to consider why do we put on masks because of trauma, but why, because of trauma, do we put these masks on and why do we keep wearing them once we're aware of that, that kind of thing? Yeah. And I think that that's really interesting. I hope we dive more into like Pirate Jenny and Red and all that stuff. They're the great panda. characters. I want more panda. Yeah, the panda guy's cool. Panda guy's cool. Panda bear. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that with uh, Lori, I think the Gene Smart iteration in this show is the most fascinating portrait of Lori that we have yet. Mostly just because I'm in love with Gene Smart. Totally. But um, I do think, yeah, you have these very interesting juxtapositions with Lori being a character that never really got to be who she actually is. She's a person who's been told who to be her entire life, whether it be one way or another. She did the masked thing. Now she's out of masks and she chose a job where she's uncovering secrets professionally. She's always in search of like uncovering the next secret because her life 
has been such a secret to herself. It's a good read. That's I love that. And I love that a lot. And it's very, very sad to see. Angela, on the other hand, orphaned practically from a very young age. She knew her parents. But other than that, she doesn't really know her background. Her grandmother was in her life for a split second before she's also ripped away from her. And she's a woman who's constantly crazy. being self-made. She's yeah. constantly yes. in charge of her own decisions and direction in life because she has no one else to tell her what to be. And she may be a little bit influenced by her early life experiences choosing the life of being a cop. But she chooses to do it pretty much on her own volition. Yeah. And so you have these two very different women that Dr. Manhattan is with. And you can tell that that is an illustration of the conflict within him, too, of what he's looking for in life. Being told what he is and what he's going to do. Or can he have the choice to maybe change things? Mm -hmm. And I think he does hope to see Angela as like a way out of this. Mm -hmm. And then Vite gives him the power to be able to do it entirely. Yeah. Until he's not anymore. He gets but. to be a normie for a little bit. <laughs> a normie. <laughs> yeah, and Angela and Dr. Manhattan do seem to have like the most connection than his other spouses and mm -hmm. relationships. Uh, I would say almost as far as like, you know, she's almost as maybe as important to him relationship wise as Vite, who he seems to like he is genuinely interested in. Um, because I think that they both share the kind of the God complex where Manhattan, he can't control it. He is a God. So he has a God complex and Vite has a God complex because he, he will never be Dr. Manhattan yeah. and he wants to be. <clears throat> I also think Dr. Manhattan like is very narcissistic when it comes to other humans, but Vite is very like believes strongly in the power of men. Mm -hmm. like, well, again, and, and this man, is like, it's like not humanity. narcissism, it's, it's realism. Yeah. Like he's yeah, like, he's just I like, already know what's going up. to happen. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Vite is just like, if I just do this big, if I give them a little push, they'll, they get, will figure it out. It. They yeah. will do it. Yeah. And it's because I did it though. So it's yes. like kind of that relationship to humanity. Mm -hmm. Whereas like Dr. Manhattan's very distant. And, you know, it's the irony is that people look to him as as the God they've mm. always wanted while, you know. That's the big Vite's irony, like to use that word, too, of the end of the <clears> comics, <throat> which is Vite asking Dr. Manhattan, like, do you think it was worth it what I did? And this is coming from a, a character that for 12 issues over the course of over a year that these things have come out, we've seen he's got little toy figures of himself. Yeah. On his desk, he's got <laughs> statues of himself in his room. He's got bases all over the place. He calls himself the smartest man in the world. This is a very egotistical, ego-driven person Yeah, who likes to be in the spotlight and the point of attention. And his entire plan is to do something secretly. We know that even if it does work, that he has to tell people that he did it. Mm. And one of the most interesting things that the show does is that it shows years later, he still hasn't told people. And it's driving him insane. Yeah. And he need, he's almost trying to like self-sabotage himself. And the only way that he's like, I can't do this because it will ultimately destroy the world if I tell them that it did because they'll just blow each other up is to be sent away. And he thinks that's what he wants, but it's not. It's not what he wants. No. Save me, daughter. <laughs> yeah, I think Vite is actually maybe not the opposite of what you said, Robbie. But mm -hmm. yeah, he is a man who... Wants to believe that he trusts in the power of mankind. Yeah. But he ultimately doesn't. And well, I, I, think, think he... I think mankind reveals itself to not be trustworthy to him eventually. Because sure. I think, you know, when he's watching TV, he's having genuine, like, revelations of just, like, they're fucking it up. Like, I, that's not what I thought. Was, he did not think that was going to happen. And his, mm -hmm. his ultimate wisdom, he, he was proven wrong. Yeah. I definitely think that. It's all just at the end of the day, like, when am I getting my cake? And then he gets his cake over and over he gets and over a lot again, of cake. and it he gets a lot drives of cake. him nuts. But yeah, I think he is disappointed in humanity, but also disappointed in himself because he was such a fool to believe what he was yeah. doing was going to bring this Change end anything. goal. Right, right. So I'll ask you guys, we've been skirting around a lot of characters and a lot of plots. Are there any particular episodes you wanted to discuss? I feel like I touched on I, – I generally, like, skimmed over the ones that I thought were the strongest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I do – like I mean, I think the whole show is really good. I do I, – I've talked to a lot of people who were not into the show until the Looking Glass episode. Oh, <clears> really? <throat> yeah. Like, a few, a few buddies of mine, they're like, should I keep watching this? Like, I don't really get it. I'm not really into it. I'm like, 
I guess I get it. I, I love, was. I love those conversations. I was. <laughs> you're just like. You're just like. Well, I'm not allowed to say what I think is going on right now. Sure. Because well, then everybody's like, Mike Bird is a dickhead. He called Brad stupid because he didn't like the first three episodes of Watchmen. You can get it. Like, fuck you, Brad. Yeah. Well, Brad's looking <laughs> a little dumbass. Stupid. Then don't watch it. I was like, I, so Brad. like we were all on board from the fucking beginning, right? But yeah. I was like, all right. I was like, you just yeah, like get to this episode. Mm. And if you still don't like it, then just like back out. You don't, I mean, you're not going to dig it. There's you know? a lot of world building and like explaining all, in that Looking Glass episode too. Yeah. Well, I mean, Looking Glass episode, like you see the squid. You see, it's the, that's really when like <laughs> everyone wanted the squid. We all wanted. Squid. And we got I it. wanted the squid too. It's pretty fucking. Cool. And it's awesome. It looks. You mm-hmm. know, they have the balls to this. Zack Snyder didn't have the balls to do the fucking squid. No, he did not. He chickened out. He, he chickened thought out. humanity did not want the squid. No. Zaddy. He was wrong. Humanity wants the squid. <laughs> Release um, the Snyder Cut. But yeah, I do think I think the Looking Glass episode is the beginning of like the best episodes of the season. Mm. And uh, you know, any one of them can be dissected for hours on end. So do you think I mean I guess you'd be putting words in your friends' mouths, but it seems like Looking Glass is probably the most human of all of the characters, probably the most relatable. <laughs> As a human who's been affected He's, by this crazy he thing. He and Angela are the best bridge characters from this new iteration to the old. Yes. Because he's directly affected by the trauma of Watchmen proper. And he's a he's a person. He's and a he's new a person. character. So. Yeah. And he's fleshed out. Like, he feels like, like Looking Glass feels like he can be, fr- like, I was like, oh, yeah, Looking Glass is in, ep- is in you know, issue 12 or whatever. He's not. But, like, you, you could mm-hmm. see him being from that world. And then Angela... Right. Also, like, they're very good bridge characters mm-hmm. in that way. But I think he is almost like a stronger bridge than a- and Angela in some oh, cases. Definitely. And I think True's in there as well. And this is like the basic concept sure. of creating these characters who are versions of the original Watchmen. True is Vite. Uh, Sister Knight is Night Owl. Looking Glass is obviously the Rorschach yeah. character. But they are not specifically these characters. They're kind of archetypes. They're taking yeah. these kind of things and... Presenting them in like a different kind of 20th century twist. I do think, you know, the – I think the best episode of Watchmen and the episode that like exemplifies all of the show's like overall strengths is in the Stalch episode because it recontextualizes Hood of Justice and it's just – it's fucking incredible what it's like doing with time. And then I think the follow-up best episode is is uh, uh, a man walks into an A-bar – um, because they bar. have they have to sell that uh, Doctor Manhattan is, is charismatic, mm-hmm. and they and they sell it in that episode. Because you have to be like, why the fuck would she want to date this person? Mm-hmm. And he's like suave as fuck, so it works out. I think he's foreign, but also suave. I think he's I think got it's... I think he's got some general swag in that in that episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has to, otherwise, why would she? You know, get with him exactly. Yeah, he pulls the egg out. Mm-hmm. This is all the all the tricks you do on the first date. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all the tricks. You tell them you're already in love. You know oh all that Oh my god, crazy stuff. this is an egg. Do you want to fuck? <laughs> it's gonna end in tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna fuck but that's, you. But that's the thing. He has to. He has to sell that. He's like, I'm pretty cool though, despite all this weird shit I'm telling you. <laughs> or it's just hammered. I don't know. Yeah. That's interesting, though. I I do think A Fear of Lightning is a great episode. Mm-hmm. It definitely starts putting together all of the inner workings of what Tulsa is now, yeah, which is very fascinating. And it also brings religion into it because Looking Glass was originally like selling – well, not selling, handing away religious pamphlets. Yeah, he's uh, not, not like a missionary, but, you know. Mm-hmm. He's I, speaking the, the, the word God to the common folk. Yes, so yeah, I definitely think it's a good bridging episode. I'm I'm shocked though. I didn't realize that a lot of people or a lot of people you know weren't into it until that episode. Yeah. I mean, I I get it and I don't I mean like I don't get it cuz I'm like the show's great. Uh mm-hmm. even if it's like even if it's not like super watchman-y at that point like it's still like awesome. But uh you know, I think some people Everyone has – when it comes to, like, reading stuff, like, that's when people can really have, like, wildly different interpre- interpretations of it. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, Alan Moore has that great quote when people come up to him and be like, dude, I love Watchmen. I'm Warshack. Like, I'm Warshack. And he was like, get the fuck away from <laughs> me. And, you know, like, those people still exist. Or, like, Zack Snyder is the person who read Watchmen. He's like, Warshack is the coolest character. It's like, that guy's a piece of shit. You're not supposed to like Rorschach. He's interesting. No, yeah. Yeah. He inspires a white supremacist his, his organization. organization. Like, yeah. Yeah. 
he bad. gives the he gives the thing to the new frontiersman, which is essentially like I don't know, like the Washington Hill or the Hill or yeah. whatever the fuck, like some white supremacist organization feigning as a newspaper today. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's Fox News essentially. Like it's not yeah, good. it's like bullshit. Yeah, so <laughs> so I get I get that you know people can be into it at that point because you know you have different interpretations of the of the comic book, and I think that's kind of what does it for me. I was like. I think I get why. I mean, I think we like the show from the beginning because we got Watchmen. I also think we had a lot of stock in, in Lindelof too. You guys probably mm-hmm. in particular because I know you really dig like the leftovers and stuff too. I haven't really yeah, watched leftovers it. is an okay show. That's <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. I guess. But like, so you know, like we could have you know gone in and just been sold from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, I still I love those like first. I think that first episode is fucking great. That pilot episode is. amazing. I think it's so good, and it's so like it's so like the the salt sprinkle of Watchmen. Mm-hmm. You're seeing like this nice roast get made the entire season, you know, but they start with just a little bit of the, the salt and the marinade and it, and it simmers and that nice Watchmen, you know, juice. And then by the end of it, you have a nice fresh meal and they even give you a little bit of potatoes. <laughs> what a nice analogy. I was very hungry. Yes. And I was going to say, I was like, you sound hungry. <laughs> You're spitting a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you started sweating. It's weird. Yeah, I think all of the episodes were wonderful, but yeah, that Minutemen episode is just next level. You keep calling it the nostalgia episode, but yeah, the Minutemen episode. Yeah, I mean, you know, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so good. And and yeah, the way they they recontextualize Hood of Justice is, mm-hmm. is so good. And, I, and that's like that's like one of my favorite things about the show is that they, you know, they make the, the kind of the first Avenger, so to speak, they like, you know, make him far more interesting than he's ever been in the comic and and uh I don't know, just the way they figured out how to do that. like I like my brain would have never if someone you know is why they didn't they didn't ask me to make the Watchmen show. Mm-hmm. That's why they didn't ask me because I couldn't create something so creative about the source material, you know. And I love too that Lindelof was trying not to cast Regina King for a long, long time in this role of Angela. He was like, oh, I just want to keep it open. I want to keep it open. And then he started referring to Angela, like, in the writer's room as Regina on accident. And yeah. they're like, call call Regina. Yeah. Let her come read for this. She is, <laughs> you, she is so – You want her she is to be so this character. She's so fucking good in the show. And she kind of, like, anchors the whole thing. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah. But, yeah, then to have in the Minutemen episode – um, the the man who plays Hooded Justice actually played her son in The Leftovers, which oh, is really? That's wonderful. Cool. That's yeah, there's a lot of fun leftover cast like kind of appearances and stuff, which is my big thing. Yeah, you you I had a theory that re- it wasn't even like a theory. I mean, I guess it, it it got to a point where I was pushing it as a theory, sure. but it was just a hope that um, what's his face was going to show up as Doctor Manhattan. Uh, oh yeah, um, no, we got the more woke version. I always I always mess up. I can't remember his name, and I want to say um, Jeremy Solomer, which is the director of Into the Dark and Green Room. It's Justin Thoreau. The, Justin Thoreau. Yeah, yeah, I wanted Justin Thoreau well, in his big snack body to show up and be snack uh, daddy. There's still night owl hopes out there for you. That is very true. Yeah. I don't think he'd be a good night owl. No, yeah. I want him now to show up as like you know Senator Keene's like super even more racist brother. <laughs> I'm so, so racist. Yeah. I'm mean, just like you thought my you th- I say I say I say I say I say, I say, I say <laughs> you thought my brother was racist. <laughs> I uh, you know one of the things from the Snyder movie, which uh, despite what Lindelof says, which I I brought it to you and you kind of posited this like uh when they do like the american hero story clips in mm-hmm. the show like they look so snyder-esque and like whether they're poking fun or paying homage to i don't know but they definitely have to be referencing that mm-hmm. um and those scenes are fucking great too uh i forgot where i was going with that there's oh, also there you go. american <laughs> hero story is is a good part of the show there's also a good little tie-in and they definitely winked at it hardcore in the episode where you get a little bit of American horror story or horror story, American hero, hero story, story. Mm-hmm. which is a nod to American horror story because they cast Cheyenne Jackson as the white version of Hooded oh, Justice. And he's also in American horror story. Well, and there you go. So there's a lot of like really great winks yeah. at the audience, but not in a way that takes you out of the episodes. Just like mm-hmm. fun lived in pulp drama. You also get one of the best songs, the uh, the Mueller time. That's good. 
<laughs> it's good very stuff. good. Yeah, the soundtrack to this show, the soundtrack and score to the show is uh, it's also next level. on the next level. Yes, it's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all of the extra material that goes along with this show yeah. is revisiting some Matrix level, next level marketing. Just the soundtracks, yeah. the the PDPs, mm-hmm. all of the extra little Easter eggs they were releasing throughout the episodes. But it doesn't feel like kind of like over the top or like no. you really got to like, you know, shell out the dough to do your homework and get all – or shell out the time even to like kind of figure out all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I feel like it does a good job of, like, being there if you need it. I mean, if you really want to find out the secrets of Lube Man, you got to go on Pedipedia. Lube Man. 2020. If you got, if you want to know the I truth. I haven't read any of the extra stuff. I won't I, spoil I wanted it here. to try and, like, you know, when somebody hasn't read it and they're just like, well, I don't get this about the show. I can explain it without, like, being like, well, yeah, but I read the liners because, like, that is not how shows work. No. Correct. But if it makes it better and it makes the marinade – Sweeter makes the marinade a bit you sweeter. You know, that makes the potatoes on the side pop a little bit. Maybe, there. maybe there's some mushrooms in Honestly, there. Honestly, the pedipedia is like you know, it's the asparagus on the side, and you you don't have to eat the you don't have to eat the veggies if you're not into the asparagus. I for one, I love asparagus. You nice, should, and you should eat your a veggies. nice. You should eat your vegetables, make it big and strong. So like maybe read pedipedia if you want. I'm not I'm not here to tell you what to do. Yeah, I think this is a good juxtaposition with. This latest Star Wars movie. I was just where, yeah. <laughs> well, they're like, there's this companion art book that apparently has all the all the answers you the need movie. because the movie didn't yeah. do its job. Oh yeah, the 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 Sith troopers were children of the Sith loyalists that worship the dark side. It's like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the people in the red armor were were children. Were anything before they were that? It's like, yes. What's a Sith loyalist? You know, they uh you haven't seen them in nine movies in forty years, but they're out there too and don't, spoilers don't for worry Star about Wars. It. <laughs> fuck that fucking <laughs> fucking fuck 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 <laughs> But yeah, I think that as you said, the PDPDs are for fun and they, they add an extra level, but a yeah. fun extra level that you don't need to understand what's it's going like, on. It's like it's like a show. layer it's kind of like seeking Smart exposition somewhere else. Right. You know, it's like it's all like they have like the uh, diagram of the Excal Abar uh, super dildo. Mm-hmm. The only word I can describe it as is the super dildo. Mm-hmm. Um, the space and, it, junk. and it's like the and this yeah. So like you know all that 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 fun stuff is there and that's really good and and that's some of the stuff that feels the most like um, you know also like one of the components of Watchmen the graphic novel is is like the literary elements to it as well and that that, that kind of fills that void more than anything. Right, right. Mm-hmm. All of the the like excerpts little, and books exactly. and things like that. Yeah, exactly. So we we've been talking about music and we kind of talked about acting, but let's just talk quickly about how good this show looks. Oh, how they got away? Hell yeah! With all of the set design and especially Lady True's crazy. Yeah, I feel compound. like we haven't even really talked about her. Lady True at all? Yeah, really. Yeah, she's a fun character. <laughs> but she's cool. She's cool. She she uh she kind of has like a very complete arc though. Mm-hmm. She also gets like axed by the end. I will say, while I don't agree with what Lady True was doing as a whole, hmm. I was very sad to see her go. It's a very bummer sad. that you won't see any more of her unless they you know explain with science why it's not real, so they can do whatever they want. <laughs> it's true. They can do whatever they want. That is very lady. She true. is also like cloning people, so there's nothing to say that there's like a couple other trues out there. I That's wouldn't get it. I her, built Snow. Her oh God. Her I mean her uh daughter and or baby mom is still alive, right? Yep. Yep. Beyond. So, beyond. So you know, who fucking who fucking knows? Beyond beyond. Beyond, She's still beyond. alive. Yeah, I think there's there's another quote I read where Dind- or uh, Dindelof, Lindelof, oh my God. <laughs> has no one done that before? Because that was fucking funny. When Dindelof was like, uh, he's like, we're not doing Watchmen babies. Like he was very much trying to, which is funny because that's like the opposite of what Star Wars is doing. Yes, Star Wars is just like, no, we are 100 percent doing Star Wars babies. That's all this show. That's all this dumb shit is. But he he was very much trying to like not just make it like this is the younger generation of Watchmen. He tried to. But Lady True, you know, is a good twist on that kind of idea. Mm-hmm. She's the unwilling uh, spawn of of a uh, vi- right. mm-hmm. I never gave myself to a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she did get the stigmata in that last episode, so maybe she'll just go like sleep for like three days and then rise. 
Maybe. Maybe. She, she'll come right back. I saw a big thing fall on her face, so I don't know. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Well, I feel like we definitely did a lot of talking as the show progressed throughout the nine weeks that the show was on the air. Yeah. And I think we've really exhausted it, but we've definitely skirted around uh, all the things I think we wanted to talk about. Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross score is great. Yes. 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 Touched on that. Uh yeah, it's really good. I, I I definitely want to watch it again. You know, once the 2019 dust settles a little bit, mm-hmm. I can I can rewatch some things. No, I, I can definitely mm-hmm. see myself like falling into you know a few viewings of like two three episodes at a time of this. Yeah, yeah and yeah. like kind of watch rewatching it again. And it's the type of show like most Lindelof properties that on a rewatch you get to pick up on things more that things, yeah. you know aren't necessarily like planned connections but i f- the things that i find more interesting are opportunistic connections yeah. where lindelof does something in season 1 that he had no intention of going somewhere in season 2 but it, he sees the opportunity and yeah. he goes for it and it makes it very interesting it's 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 more in, it's as interesting it's not more interesting but it's it's the type of interest that you get in somebody improvising something as opposed to somebody doing a very good performance of something scripted. Sure. It, there's something that is impressive about mm-hmm. not only the ability to perform well, but to just kind of come up with it. Yeah. No matter how much it is scripted, you know, before it's actually executed and shown on TV. Just the idea. It's like, well, we didn't plan on season one going there, but we decided to do this now. And I think that's something that I find interesting to experience and then think about afterwards fair enough i liked listening to the hbo podcast about watchmen they did a podcast after every three episodes so there were three in total yeah and it was just damon lindelof and an hbo person i forget his name anyway um during those interviews i liked listening to lindelof talking about all of the ideas that did get thrown out in the writer's room and how a lot of his ideas didn't land and he was grateful for it Mm -hmm. so i think that creative process is very cool that he wanted like the elephant not to be there in the room he was not the one who came up with the elephant and then someone said well it's got to be this and he's just like gosh darn it you're You're right right. (laughs) It really is the – it's remarkable how I really think it's the best version of the show that could possibly exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, you can't say that about a lot of things in general, you know, even things you really like. It's That's like true. it's like, no, this is like it, – it, it's very thought out. You know, but also very bold. Yes. And that's always something I appreciate. I think that's like, you know, by doing the things that we do, like being kind of critical of, of film and TV and art, like that's one of the things I've, I'm realizing that I'm a, I'm a stickler for, something that really like – grabs me no matter what if, if if there's a property that is trying to be bold and trying to make a strong choice i have a g- way greater appreciation for it and this show is is bold capital b yeah i like people to make bold choices a but also commit to them and not yeah. shy away later on yeah I'd be like oh my god you're gonna erase c-3po's memory that's kind of crazy that's so bold oh you just changed your mind <laughs> That's fine. Spoilers for Star Wars. That's, that's, that's fine. Oh, you got two jokes out of this really weird gag? All right. Oh, good. Let's cool. just erase it. Just like we erased the memory in the first place. Mm-hmm. Let's just wreck on the movie as we Wouldn't it have been more it. interesting if Babu Frick fixed Ray's lightsaber like towards the end? Like she didn't have a lightsaber throughout the whole thing. He was like, and, like, and he just put it back together? It's not that type of episode. No, it really isn't. <laughs> Any last words from you guys? Love Watchmen. Wrapping up? Watch Love it. Love Watchmen. Watch. Who watches the Watchmen? We watch the Watchmen. And so should you. And so should you. Very good. Ringing endorsement. Yeah. I like it. All right. Well, then I guess this brings us to the end of this Watchmen podcast. Definitely look into all of the other Watchmen related content out there. There are lots of YouTube channels that are doing Easter egg hunts for all of the different episodes. This world is vast. Please dig in. It's a fun world to be in. Some would say probably more fun than the world we're in right now. So check out all that Watchmen related material. Maybe throw some money at some albums. Support the cause. I gotta get some vinyls. (laughs) <laughs> I know it's after Christmas. You didn't get everything on your Christmas list. Well, treat yourself. And thank you guys for being with me this morning. Thank you. To talk about this show and to talk about it during the nine weeks that we all watched it and loved it. 
It was fun to talk about. Another sh- a show that I'm glad was released week to week. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Like, I, I have my works. opinion. It I have, works to its advantage. Yeah. Like, I think some things you can crush. I think some things you can separate. I th- but this was a very – it was very nice to have a week in between to talk about it. Absolutely. And don't forget, listeners, to go to storyscreenbeacon.com. You'll find all types of articles, reviews, podcasts, showtimes if you're in the local area of Beacon, New York. Come out and watch a movie with us. We would love to see you. Come out and talk about movies with us or television. That's great, too. We welcome all types of conversations. And make sure to be keeping your eyes peeled. We're going to be doing some top tens or best of 2019 lists coming out soon. And then we'll be doing a couple of our favorite podcasts in the near future, the best of 2019 and our Oscar predictions. So look forward to those two podcasts coming out soon. But other than that, thank you so much for spending some time with us. And for now, we shall say goodbye. I do. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye, Goodbye. Goodbye John. I, I think I'm killing it. You, no, you are. Thank you. I'm just showing comparatively how good you are. Thank you. Being thank you so much. You're welcome. I do it all the time. Thanks. You'll be cast as Vite in the next season of Watchmen. I'll be great. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. So what are we doing? How are we doing? Hmm. Any prep? We don't need anything? I don't think so. I think we're just going to let it. Let it ride. Big Be its blue own thing. Dicks. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Swapping. Oh my gosh. <laughs>